the flipping profile. So you're about to get your debrief on your flipping profile. You may have already been online and, and done the profile and entered the email addresses of uh, those that are going to do your 360. So this video is just to give you a bit of an outline as to what it's all about, what to expect before we do the debrief. Also to set up a few little rules of the game to make sure you get the most out of it. So the first thing is to understand, you know, what is flipping? You've gone online, or if you haven't gone online, you'll see that you go on and you ask to tick all these little boxes of words that might describe you. You know, how can that possibly come up with a uh, you know, profile that would describe you? Well, you're pleased to know the Flippin' group has been around for more than 30 years, and this profile is used not only in Fortune 500 companies, it's used and in fact started with a lot of elite sporting organizations. You know, the Dallas Cowboys, the New York Yankees, these are organizations that now use the Flippin' profile as a recruiting tool to make sure they're getting the right sort of people on board. Also used by the US Army, so there are some pretty credible sources using the Flippin' profile. One of the things that differentiates, differentiates Flippin' from other profiles out there is firstly the 360 viewpoint in the fact that it's not just the you that's giving the, the opinion of how, you, how you're being perceived, but it's other people that are giving the feedback. It's also prescriptive and preventive, meaning that from the information that we get, we can give very clear traction steps or things that you can do to overcome some of the constraints that come up in your profile. There's not too many other profiles that can do that. So how does it work? Well, as you know, you go on and you click the different uh, buttons of words that may describe you and you know, up to six people of your peers that know you're in a work environment are going to do the same thing. Now what that does is it tells the, the, uh, the tool how you're being perceived and the, you know, what's the behavior that you're demonstrating. It takes each of those words and it, it ranks them against 12 different scales. I'm not going to go into the details of what those 12 scales are. Uh, all I will say is over the 30 years of using this profile, there's in fact about 45 different scales, but they've managed to get it down to the key 12 that can always be linked to the behavioral constraints that prevents, prevents someone from being their best. Now what is the best? What's the benchmark that is used for this profile? Great question. And actually it's a little bit of a setup because the benchmark has been used, to, it's been created by thousands of different profiles that have been gathered among elite performers in a variety of fields. And in effect, the tool has taken the best from each of those profiles and compiled it into like the total person. So the profile of the benchmark is almost like Mr. or Mrs. Perfect in terms of high performance in any area. So performance, it could be sporting or it could be business, it could be any of those. You'll find that to be a good performer in business requires a lot of the same characteristics as it does in sport. And in fact, any field uh, that you choose to endeavor. So as we go through, some constraints are going to come up through this tool for you. you know, everyone has constraints. So you're being matched against Mr. or Mrs. Perfect, so don't be too hard on yourself. So what are we going to go over? We're going to, when we do the debrief, you know, I'm going to look at your profile, I'm going to look at the data that's being uh, put out from the profile, and I just got to say, the, the algorithms that underpin this profile are just, they're absolutely mind-blowing. I had them explain to me when I went through the training on to become a flippin' certified instructor, and it just absolutely blew me away, the level of detail that the algorithms go into. I won't even begin to explain it here, you don't need to know it. All you need to know is that it's a really cool tool that's been used on thousands of thousands, literally thousands upon thousands of different performers. So for you, we're going to take a look at the data and I'm going to be coaching you around what the data is telling you. And the important thing to keep in mind is the data that's coming to you is not yourself, it's a little bit about what you said, mostly about what other people said. The, the tool really weights uh, other people's opinions higher than yours. Sorry about that. Now what we're going to look at first is your strengths. Now you probably already know a lot of your strengths. What we're going to see is what are other people seeing as your strengths. And this is a really important thing and almost the most important part of the tool because I'm a firm believer in leveraging your strengths, not working on your weaknesses. So we've got to reaffirm what they are. Now the second part is the constraints. This is where people start to sweat a little bit and get a little bit nervous. Notice we use the word constraints and not weaknesses. And here's how I define the two. A weakness is something that would be inherent in your, your talent makeup. Generally something that can't be 
it could be improved, but you'll never become an elite performer at a weakness. It just, it's not gonna happen. For example, um, if you look at me, I'm not very tall. <laughs> so to think that I was ever gonna be as good as Michael Jordan on a basketball court, yeah, I could probably get pretty good at free throws if I practice enough, but I'm never gonna be Michael Jordan. All right, that's a, that would be a weakness within me. My height would be a weakness when it comes to basketball. Now, so constraints on the other side are behavioral based. And ironically, they can often be strengths that we take too far. And I'll give you an example for myself. If you ask people closest to me to describe me, they'd say, listen, Jamie can be very spontaneous and he's great at making quick decisions. And then if you ask them, listen, is that a strength or a constraint? They just look at you and say yes, right? It's both, it can be both. Sometimes making quick decisions can be a real strength because it gets actions, it gets things moving. That said, if you do it too fast without enough thought, it can be a real constraint because you might make the wrong decision too quickly. So that's a constraint that I'm aware of that I have to work on. So we're gonna look at your constraints. Now, when we do that, I wanna give you three warnings right now. There can be the tendency, particularly when dealing with elite performers, that sometimes we don't like what we're hearing. And remember, this is the tool that has been uh, analyzed from what other people are seeing. So this is not necessarily things that you can see within yourself, because you might see yourself differently from how other people see it. It's what other people are telling you and the feedback you're getting. So the first one is saying immediately, oh, that's not me. There's no way that can be right, <laughs> okay? It is what other people are seeing. So whether you think it's right or not is kind of irrelevant. It's what people are seeing. So just sit back and just listen to it and let's be open about it, okay? Deal. Right, number two. Oh, that's because of, now start to justify it or give excuses why this is turning up in the data. Turn off the excuse button, just sit back again and just take it. It doesn't really matter why you believe it is. All it is important to understand is that that behavior is there and then let's look at the traction steps of what can be done to overcome it. And the last one is, yeah, I, I knew that already. Yeah, I know about that. And so the problem with saying the I knew that, whether you did or you didn't, is that it sort of dismisses it as saying, so I know that's already a problem, I'm already doing okay, so we don't need to worry about that. That's kind of the subconscious conversation that's going on. Now, it's up to you whether you wanna work on this stuff or not. I'm not here to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. I am guessing though that you, you are quite open to this because we have done a flipping profile. So what I would suggest is we just park all those excuses and listen, if they come up internally, that's, that's probably pretty normal. I had a few of these came up when I did mine. I just parked them to the side and said, okay, listen, I just gotta remain open to this stuff and look at the traction steps and see how I can apply it. Now, I will mention one other thing is when we look at the traction steps, these are gonna be specific actions that you can take to rectify or work on some of your constraints. This is not necessarily easy work, right? Depending on how old you are, right? You might be in your mid 30s, 40s, 50s, or even 60s. That's how many years that you've been practicing this constraint, all right? So it might be unrealistic to think that you're gonna take this and all of a sudden work on it and next week it's all gonna be better. This is something that you're gonna have to work on over and over. And you're starting to get feedback and get opinions from others as to whether you're seeing a difference or not. You'll start to see things show up in your life. You start to get improved results. So I'm here to issue, I guess, a little bit of education on what to expect and what flipping is. A few warnings around how not to react when we start to do the debrief. And then lastly, a bit of a, a disclaimer to say, this is not necessarily gonna be easy and something you're gonna have to be, work at uh, into the future. Anyway, we'll have fun with it and I look forward to the debrief.